Good people, we are gathered together to mark this cathedral church's setting apart of its poet's corner. To this end, I bid you remember before God all those who in every age have enriched human life and writing by their gift of poetry, and more particularly, those who in our own country have, with the same gift, made our existence here both understandable to ourselves and to our neighbors. With thanks to God for all these, then, let us pray together the prayer common to us all. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. In all great cultural and academic events, it's terribly important to have endorsements, lest there are those who might think you are imposters. And obviously, the most important endorsement that we could get would be from the Abbey. Some of you have perhaps heard of the Poets' Corner there. But before I read, in fact, 
the most charming and delightful letter from the dean and chapter, I want to announce that we have two surprises. The first is a very young surprise, 10 years old. This is a marvelous young lady whom you perhaps noticed in the procession carrying a bouquet of red roses. And this is Jennifer Kristen Anderson, who comes from Elliott, Maine, and who came down with her grandfather and her mother today. And she, at the conclusion of the service, will lay the flowers on the memorial tablet to Emily Dickinson because she is her first cousin, five times removed. <laughs> And here is the endorsement. It gives me great pleasure. Indeed, I regard it as a privilege to send the greetings of the Dean and Chapter of Westminster to you on the day when you are formally dedicating your American Poets' Corner in the Arts Bay in the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine, New York. As you know, we have in Westminster Abbey a poet's corner in which Geoffrey Chaucer is buried and memorialized. A memorialization which has led across the centuries to successive poets and creative writers being honored near him in Poet's Corner. I therefore greet you most warmly on this significant day. And I can assure you that it gives satisfaction here that a great nation which speaks the tongue which Shakespeare spake and is linked up with us in a common literary heritage should have the means in a cathedral church of honoring those who have used this language with felicity, grace, and genius. I know I am right when I say that you will not lack many such worthies to honor in the coming years, signed Edward Carpenter. In residence, he considered many candidates among the nation's published poets and chose Daniel Haberman, the widely praised author of the Furtive Wall and Poems, whose qualifications for this extraordinary post were unintentionally delineated by John Heath Stubbs in an earlier review of Haberman's work. Of Haberman, he said, he has a restraint and a care for craftsmanship which is very welcome these days. And Guy Davenport has said of his work, they are first of all quintessential poetry. Clearly, Dean Morton shows well. As to the history of the naming of this Poets Corner, we really could go back also to another point, that the Bishop of New York the Right Reverend Paul Moore, Jr., described as the genesis of the Poets' Corner, explaining in his words, several years ago, Muriel Rukeyser began the custom of placing any poem sent to the cathedral on a bulletin board in a corner of the cathedral. Poems came from children, prisoners, all sorts and kinds. Now we are to establish a poet's corner, similar to that part of Westminster Abbey, where a lasting memorial to the great writers of America may be made. And the bishop said so well, writers sing of truth and love and life. They are our contemporary prophets. We rejoice in having this tribute to them in the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine. Reflecting our nation's democratic tradition, the poets to be honored here 
two deceased writers to be memorialized annually will be chosen democratically, or at least more nearly so than in England where the Dean of Westminster Abbey does the selecting. Here there shall be a committee of electors, although ever true to my journalistic uh, profession, I must report to you that the Dean of St. John the Divine will permanently retain a final veto over all activities. The first electors chosen after considerable consultation with several of the most senior poets in America represent the highest level of serious literature in our nation, assuring the prestige befitting the Poets' Corner. And their names you will find on your program. We might say that no stone has remained unturned to make of this what the dreamers conceived. The calligraphy and stone cutting for the Poets' Corner are being done by John Benson of Rhode Island, the dean of American stone cutters. His family members have been stone cutters since the Revolution. The inscriptions are being composed in consultation with experts on the writers to be memorialized. The corner will be a living memorial as well. The cathedral's poetry wall will be expanded to include displays of American writers, and the corner plans to invite major poets to read here and to give master classes within the cathedral. Prominent actors also will be invited to read, as will the poet in residence, particularly in his case to the residents of the neighborhood, old and young, to bring, bring poetry where it belongs, as the universal language that speaks to the heart of all peoples, no matter their age or station in life. That this occasion is worthy of notice, worthy of history, is testified to by communications received. The mayor of New York, Mayor Koch, has proclaimed this America's Poet Corners Day. The President of the United States has sent us a message. We commend your endeavors to ensure permanent recognition of the men and women who have contributed so significantly to this country's literary heritage. Their work is a national treasure of which we can all be justly proud. And Mayor Como has, in a thoughtful proclamation from the executive chamber, quoted from the works of Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, Washington Irving, who are honored here today, and sums up, I think so nicely, the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard defined a poet as follows, someone whose heart is penetrated by a great event, but his lips are made in such a way that he groans inside, and the cries outside which pass through them turn into enchanting music. What beautiful music, says the governor, those who are honored in the poet's corner at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine have given to mankind. Now therefore, I, Mary O. M. Como, governor of the state of New York, do hereby proclaim May 7, 1984, as Poets' Corner Day. to have so many members of the literary community at this dedication and to have the recognizable support of other areas and other arts, journalism, to dance, acting, music. We have two honorary guests with us today, Mr. Mater 
and Martha Graham. At three o'clock today, I received a letter from Ms. Graham following a telephone call that because of rehearsals for the opening of the Graham Company at, I believe, the Metropolitan, she sends her regrets and best wishes. But she sent three sentences which I would like to share with you. And this is Martha Graham's comment. They had no poet, so they died. These lines, written long ago in Greece, were about a vanished city. They had no artist to record their dreams, their hopes, their beliefs, and so they perished. These lines came back to me when first I learned of this visionary project, An American Poet's Corner. I regret that I cannot be with you to share this moment, for poetry to me reveals the inner landscape that is man's soul, Martha Graham. John Kenneth Galbraith has written to us as president of the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, quote, approving and applauding the proposal for a poet's corner at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And as president of the Academy of American Poets, which is celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, Mrs. Hugh Bullock has written that the cathedral is, and I quote, in the great tradition of a venerable monument across the sea. And Galway Kinnell writes, as president of Penn American Center, we at Penn are honored to have this permanent memorial. Endorsements have also been received from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. I would like to thank the vast number of people who have helped to make this day possible. It is a great joy to say, in the six months I have been poet in residence, only one person has refused my calls or letters. It is extraordinary to say that really everyone, everywhere throughout this country, stopped what they were doing and gave me immediate attention and courtesy. Without this help and the vision of the Bishop of New York, the trustees, and the dean, an American Poets Corner could not have been brought to fruition.
first class, if you please, of the American Poets Corner. We'll be honored by having a selection from their works read by three noted Americans. Robert Penn Warren will read from Walt Whitman. Gregory Peck will read from Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And Edgar Bowers will read from Emily Dickinson. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read the first five sections from When Lilac's Last in the Dooryard Bloomed, which comprise a kind of prologue for that famous poem on the death of Abraham Lincoln. When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourned, and yet shall mourn with ever-returning spring. Ever-returning spring, Trinity sure to me you bring, Lilac blooming perennial and drooping star in the west, and the thought of him I love. O oh, powerful western fallen star, O oh, shades of night, O oh, moody, tearful night, O oh, great star disappeared. Oh, the black murk that hides the star. Oh, cruel hand that holds me powerless. Oh, helpless soul of me. Oh, harsh surrounding cloud that will not free my soul. In the dooryard, fronting an old farmhouse, Near the whitewashed palings stands a lilac bush, tall, growing with heart-shaped leaves of rich green, with many a pointed blossom, rising delicate with a perfume strong I love, with every leaf a miracle. And from this bush in the dooryard, with delicate colored blossoms and heart-shaped leaves of rich green, a sprig with its flower I tear. In the swamp, in secluded recesses, a shy and hidden bird is warbling a song. Solitary, the thrush, the hermit thrush, withdrawn to himself, avoiding the settlements, sings by himself a song. Song of the bleeding throat, death's outlet song of life. For well, dear brother, I know, if thou wast not granted to sing, thou wouldst surely die. Over the breast of the spring, the land, amid cities, amid lanes, and through old woods, where latent the violets peeped from the ground, spotting the gray debris. Amid the grass in the fields, each side of the lane, passing the endless grass, passing the yellow speared wheat, Every grain from its shrouded dark brown fields uprising, passing the apple tree, blows of white and pink in the orchards, 
carrying a corpse to where it shall rest in the grave. Night and day journeys a coffin. It is the witching hour. Ichabod Crane, the schoolmaster of Sleepy Hollow, is heavy-hearted and crestfallen as he pursues his travel homewards. He has spent the evening at the rustic mansion of Baltus Van Tassel, listening to the tales and legends of ghosts and apparitions that abound in that sheltered, long-settled retreat, and pressing his suit for the hand of the delicious Katrina without success. This perverse old horse gunpowder has come to a sudden stop at a bridge over a stream in a place of cavernous gloom. Just at this moment, a plashy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. In the dark shadow of the grove, on the margin of the brook, he beheld something huge, misshapen, black, and towering. It stirred not, but seemed gathered up in the gloom like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. The hair of the affrighted pedagogue rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? To turn and fly was now too late, and besides, what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin, if such it was, which could ride upon the wings of the wind? Summoning up, therefore, a show of courage, he demanded in stammering accents, oh, who are you? He received no reply. He repeated his demand in a still more agitated voice. Still, there was no answer. Once more, he cudgeled the sides of the inflexible gunpowder and, shutting his eyes, broke forth with involuntary fervor into a psalm tune. Just then, the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion and, with a scramble and a bound, stood at once in the middle of the road. Though the night was dark and dismal, yet the form of the unknown might now in some degree be ascertained. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. He made no offer of molestation or sociability, but kept aloof on one side of the road, jogging along on the blind side of old Gunpowder, who had now got over his fright and waywardness. Ichabod, who had no relish for this strange midnight companion and bethought himself of the adventure of Brown Bones with the galloping Hessian, now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind. The other did the same. His heart began to sink within him. He endeavored to resume his psalm tune, but his parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth and he could not utter a stave. There was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for on mounting a rising ground which brought the figure of his fellow traveler in relief against the sky. Gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak, Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless. But his horror was still more increased on observing that the head, which should have rested on his shoulders, was carried before him on the pommel of the saddle. His terror rose to desperation. 
He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip. But the specter started full jump with him. Away then they dashed through thick and thin, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched out his long, lank body away over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight. They had now reached the road, which turns off to Sleepy Hollow. But Gunpowder, who seemed possessed with a demon, instead of keeping up it, made an opposite turn and plunged headlong downhill to the left. This road leads through a sandy hollow shaded by trees for about a quarter of a mile, where it crosses the bridge, famous in goblin story, and just beyond swells the green knoll on which stands the whitewashed church. As yet the panic of the steed had given his unskillful rider an apparent advantage in the chase. But just as he had got halfway through the hollow, the girths of the saddle gave way, and he felt it slipping from under him. He seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm, but in vain, and had just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder round the neck when the saddle fell to the earth and he heard it trampled underfoot by his pursuer. For a moment, the terror of Hans Van Ripper's wrath passed across his mind, for it was his Sunday saddle. But this was no time for petty fears, the goblin was hard on his haunches, an unskillful rider that he was. He had much ado to maintain his seat, sometimes slipping on one side, sometimes on another, and sometimes jolted on the high ridge of his horse's backbone with a violence that he verily feared would cleave him asunder. An opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand. The wavering reflection of a silver star in the bosom of the brook told him that he was not mistaken. He saw the walls of the church dimly glaring under the trees beyond. He recollected the place where Brom Bones, ghostly competitor, had disappeared. If I can but reach that bridge, thought Ichabod, I am safe. Just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even fancied that he felt his hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs, and old gunpowder sprung upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side. Now Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish according to rule in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then, he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him, Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It had countered his cranium with a tremendous crash. He was tumbled headlong into the dust, and gunpowder, the black steed, and the goblin rider passed by like a whirlwind.
There's a certain slant of light. There's a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that oppresses like the weight of cathedral tunes. Heavenly hurt it gives us. We can find no scar, but internal difference where the meanings are. None may teach it anything. Tis the seal despair sent us an imperial affliction sent us of the air. When it comes, the landscape listens. Shadows hold their breath. When it goes, tis like the distance on the look of death. The difference between despair, the difference between despair and fear is like the one between the instant of a wreck and when the wreck has been. The mind is smooth, no motion, contented as the eye upon the forehead of a bust that knows it cannot see. These are the days when birds come back. These are the days when birds come back. A very few, a bird or two, to take a backward look and dine the immortal wine. The last night that she, the last night that she lived, it was a common night, except the dying. This to us made nature different. We waited while she passed. It was a narrow time. Too jostled were our souls to speak. At length, the notice came. She mentioned and forgot. Then, lightly as a reed, bent to the water, shivered scarce, consented, and was dead. And we, we placed the hair and drew the head erect, and then, awful leisure was our faith to regulate.
Let us pray. Direct, O Lord, those who speak words to which many listen and write what many read, that they may do their part in making the heart of the people wise, its mind sound, its will righteous, to the honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
us, O Lord, our setting apart of a poet's corner in this cathedral church, for the honoring of those of our fellow citizens who have enriched us by their writing, poetry, and in prose, and grant that even as we record their names, even so their words may continue to live in the hearts of our people. And with this hope, we now declare this Poets' Corner dedicated in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Um, this was the uh, oboe. Well, the saxophone the and organ. Soprano I loved also. saxophone. But the, the, uh, the uh, oboe, as they were going yeah. out, I just thought that music was, yeah, it was wonderful. haunting, yeah, just so. haunting. Yeah. Yes. And the uh, Schubert. It was not great. To, uh, fine, to fine music. Uh, the pianist. One of the real the things that were fun of this whole event was picking. Much I was of going the to music. say, I bet I you really made the selections, did you? Yes. I love it. <laughs> and the Sanctus did very well. Didn't yes, it? yeah. The, the Guno. Oh, it, it was gorgeous, gorgeous. The Guno and the Schubert, and um, what, was our, what was the last. Uh, the Samuel Barber, I loved. But did you like that? Homage the, to John yeah. Fields. Uh, John that was, that was Fields Barbara Nissen. That right. was a beautiful selection. Yeah. We wanted American music, and that was. Yes, uh, and I'm also glad to hear that Tuckerman is going to be our next celebrator. <laughs>